the most coveted job for KGB agents was to go to the United States. Desmanov shared with the Americans, the gullible Americans, a master plan to undermine the United States. Yes, he did. I had to learn how to listen to Morse code. Then I had to learn a method to manually decrypt encrypted messages. The most time I spent is uh, on surveillance detection. Ah, I was going to ask about that. Surveillance is at a significant disadvantage uh, when it comes to a well-trained agent. The prerequisite is you need to get to know the city. We conducted about seven or eight exercises to simulate the reality when people were following me. And this was a contest. They, they wanted to win their contest. I beat them every time. Navalny was a very complex personality. Andropov was certain that Ronald Reagan would start a nuclear war. In East Germany to have about uh, 300,000 US dollars. <laughs> You're doing pretty good. Oh my God. <laughs> Okay, next question. Um, Vladimir Putin. <laughs>
That's where we are because these poor people, these poor people, they, 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 they got nothing. They ain't got nothing. You can't blame them for wanting to go in and steal every fucking Louis Vuitton bag. Damn, I like Louis. I don't want to pay them prices. I don't have to pay them prices. I'll just go in there, walk out with the bags or the iPhones or what have you. We've got to start respecting the law and enforcing the law. Brian? Imagine if you could be arrested for a criminal thought you had, just like the movie Minority Report. Podcast host Joe Rogan has a discussion with fellow comedian Sam Morrill about this. I have a lot of bad thoughts, Joe. Yeah, I bet you do. I bet you do when you're on those morning shows. (laughs) Imagine if you could get arrested for your thoughts. Like, cause I think some things that I would never do. You got You got to erase your browser mind thoughts too. Yeah. Like could erase you imagine, your history. Could you imagine if you could, if yeah, you yeah. had an impulse to just smash someone in the face, but you were resisting it, you weren't going to do it. Imagine if you could get arrested because you, you tested positive for a uh, p- potential aggressive episode. <laughs> right? It's like a COVID test. Like you, you get two lines. You're keeping your yeah. shit together, but you're imagining <laughs> You're imagining just teeing off on this guy, just smashing this He dude. could be a danger. Yeah. Like, hey, man, yeah. stop doing it. But if you have that thought, I'm about to smash that guy. Dee, 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 dee. A light goes off. The cops come in and they arrest you. This bothers me to no end because I have a lot of thoughts. <laughs> and I usually don't filter those thoughts out. It's, it's not uncommon for me to see someone and then wish and hope that they're walking down the street one day and a brick magically hits them in the face. That's just me. It's I've got two stepsons. I usually want to kill them once a day. I have a thought. I mentioned this yesterday that if nothing else, if everything fails, I can use my little nest egg, buy an RV, and break bad making meth and manufacturing it across the United States. <laughs> Do I mean it? I don't know. I know that it would be cool as hell, and then I could hold court in the street. I've actually said it before that when I get you know 75 years old, I'm going to adopt the cocaine habit and the heroin habit, probably take some meth at that point too, and then if anybody pisses me off, because I'm in my 70s, I'm not looking to die laying down in a bed. If anybody pisses me off, I'm just going to slap the ever-loving dog shit out of them. Needless to say, I'm a little worried that people may be locked up because of what they're thinking. And I've got to be honest with you, that's really the kind of Disney thought process that I've got. It actually goes a lot darker (laughs) than that. I am worried about that. Here, you know, the thing is, the thing is, man, we all have dark thoughts. Well, I don't know if all of us do. I know I've got dark thoughts. I know other people probably do as well. We, unless you're acting on those, I don't think that it's proper to target someone or arrest someone. That's that's like a sci-fi type of profiling. And uh, while profiling absolutely works in certain areas, just ask Israel, I'm still not the guy that, that advocates for that or would ever like to see that happen across the planet. I just think there's something wrong with that. Uh, that being said, hey, that's Joe Rogan. Joe, I know you don't watch my show, but if you do, why don't you get this happy ass on your show and we'll do something. Today's Criminal Insight, I just wanted to talk just a little bit about social engineering. So what is a social engineer? A social engineer is a con man, a liar, a manipulator. That's what social engineering is. Uh, it, it's tricking or manipulating a potential victim into giving up information, access, data, cash, into leading them to do what you want them to do without them realizing that they are being manipulated. All right, so so bear that in mind. Now, And social engineering is a cornerstone to successfully committing online crime. Uh, Think about ransomware, business email compromise, romance schemes, really any type of of 
cybercrime that's out there, it will have a degree of social engineering that that lends to its success. Ultimately, we have a lot of gray hat, white hat and black hat social engineers. Now, the thing is, you go to the black hat or DEF CON conference, you know, some of these conferences have the social engineering arena and they really go above board. You, there's been instances where, you know, people's laptops have been stolen out of their rooms. Uh, instances where uh, you're supposed to go out on the street and see just how crazy you can get with social engineering. That's on a white hat level. The truth of the matter is, as I just mentioned, a proper social engineer, it's doing just enough to get that potential victim to do what you want them to do. And then it's very important that they not realize that they have been manipulated, or if they do realize that, that they don't realize it until you've actually acquired what you want from that potential victim. All right. That's a big difference. And that's one of the things that separates the good guys from the bad guys, because the good guys do crazy shit. The bad guys understand that it's important to look legitimate all the way through. And we're going to talk more on criminal thoughts, future episodes, criminal insights as well about that social engineering. But I just wanted to have that tidbit today for today's criminal insight. Today's guest on Criminal Thoughts is Jack Barsky. He is a former KGB deep operative, a German-American author, IT specialist. Why do I want to talk to Jack? Um, geez, if if that short resume that I just told you, he's, he's got a, a magnificent career. If that short resume isn't answer enough, I'm not sure what else to tell you. Um, I am I am fascinated by Jack Barsky's life, by not only his life, but but once he stopped working with KGB, the career that he had after that um, and then what he's doing today with his life. You know, I'm, I'm Brett Johnson. I'm that former criminal. And what's most most important to me than anything is doing the right damn thing uh, of becoming that better person. And I look at Jack Barsky and I see that man who practices that every single day. So why do I want to talk to him? That's why. Jack, thank you so much for coming on the Criminal Thoughts podcast. Uh, two thoughts based on what you just uh, stated. Uh, I'm actually on my sixth career. not Sixth. Job, so I started out... Uh, as a college, a college professor, then I became a KGB agent in uh, my, my first job in, 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 in Manhattan, New York, was bike messenger. Then okay. I became a computer specialist. Then I became an, a, a manager slash executive. And now I'm a speaker and, uh, and, and, and an author. And uh, with regard to becoming a better person, you know, I, I would like to uh, summarize this under the term of sacrificial love, but not sacrificing yourself to a point where it's self-destructive. Right. I, that, that, that's a very good point. Um, let me ask you something, Jack. Um, said college professor, what I'm interested in, and, and I know you've got a long story, and I'm sure we'll touch upon a lot of that. What I'm interested in is is how were you recruited into the KGB. In those days, you could not apply either for the East German secret police, the Stasi or the KGB. They, they all recruited, they sought you out. Now, you know, I was never told exactly how they found me, uh, but just like the CIA, they were looking for individuals who were already mature, like in their early to mid twenties, pretty much had a, a, a defined personality, but weren't settled in life yet. Right. So that they would be flexible to do, you know, things that, uh, you know, married people with children most likely would not want to do. And uh, so my, I'm speculating, uh, and, and the, the fact of the matter is that uh, in East Germany, and uh, I'm, I believe in the Soviet Union as well, there, there was a file on every on every adult. The Stasi had a file on every adult, and uh, I am guessing that the, the KGB had access to to those files. And as they 
looked at my file and said, wow. You know, I, I was a standout already then because right. I had received a, a, a national scholarship that was uh, restricted to exactly 100 concurrent holders in the entire country. So wait a minute, this guy has a lot of intellect to, to begin with, but he also is a party member. He also plays sports. You took it, you take it all together. There's a really well developed personality. Let's take a look at him. Right. So, and that's, that's how they first approached me at this point. Uh, first approach, I could have said, I'm not interested. And I would, I would have walked away. No problem. But, but <laughs> so it, it's not that offer that you can't refuse. You could have refused it if you wanted. To. I absolutely could have, could have, okay. uh, where did you grow up, Jack? Uh, grew up in, in the hinterland of, of Germany, uh, well, even East Germany, uh, very close to the border with Poland, uh, in, a, in an area that was primarily rural, didn't have any industry to speak of, no institute of higher learning, just like agriculture and forestry. And unfortunately, the soil was very poor, so it was a, a poor backward section of Germany. Right. Um, period. And uh, the one thing that was good about it was the the Soviet army, as it had m marched into Germany, didn't do a lot of destruction to the villages. You know, I still remember that uh, one of the buildings I lived in had a few bullet holes and in a, in a, in the red letters written, Spirit na Berlin, that means forward to Berlin. So they were just marching through. Right. <laughs> When I was committing crime, I had contacts and associates that were in Ukraine and in Russia. But um, what you know, growing up in Eastern Germany like that, yeah, is is that a hard life? Is that uh, you said there? You know, not really much going on there. So I'm, I'm wondering what what you did to to keep engaged. You you obviously were extremely intelligent. You had this this uh, concurrent award scholarship. Yeah. How did you, were the school systems pretty good in that area the, or not? The school, the school system was, uh, and it's acknowledged after the reun reunification of Germany, the East German school system was superior to the West German. Uh, wow. and, and there was, you know, we, we had leadership that was uh, m mostly not very intelligent, but, but they understood that because of East Germany was, destroyed and had not a lot of natural resources, uh, we had to focus on science because science with science, you can leverage a lot and, and, and build build an economy. Right. So I, I have a, a copy of the curriculum of my senior year in high school and half half the time we spent in science and math. Half the time. Half the time, science wow. and math. I and mean, we were drilled. So, uh, but getting back to growing up as a child, uh, how, how I stayed engaged, I was an avid reader. Uh, I even fiction, nonfiction. I even uh, even nonfiction. Uh, I, I read fiction. I, I read uh, because I found them. I read. I was maybe in uh, fifth grade. I found the you know the Greek mythology, the uh, Odyssey, and, and a few other books. I read those, and. Uh, I read the Brothers Grimm end to end, mm. and non uh, and nonfiction. Uh, the uh, I read every, before school started. We we got all the books, and the day school began, I had finished a history book. I was just interested. I don't know why, but you know, I'm, I've always been curious. <clears throat> uh, I also because uh, w when the weather was bad. You couldn't go out and play outside, and uh, there were no play dates where you because it, my next friend was too far away, so I had to right. like, you know, be by myself. And I played board board games against myself, and again I went back to reading. And eventually, once I uh, my grandmother gave me a, a small radio uh, when by the time I uh, went to high school, and so I started listening to radio. And uh, of course, rock and roll. Of course. <laughs> Who's your favorite band? My favorite band, by with no close seconds, uh, the Beatles. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> You're either a Beatles man or a Rolling Stones man. <laughs> yeah, we had the same. We had the same thing. You know, you either were for the Stones or the Beatles. 
and everybody else was just also ran. So. That's it. That's it to a T. So, and, and and what's your favorite book? My favorite book. Yeah. Uh, okay. Agent Zigzag. Agent Zigzag. So what oh, is that? That is a nonfiction written by, and every time I think about him, uh, I would have to walk to my bookshelf to get the name of the author. Uh, it's um, he, 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 he's written, he's very successful. Is he ben McIntyre. Ben McIntyre, exactly. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, and uh, an Agent Zigzag is about a triple agent uh, uh, in World War II, small-time criminal who volunteered to go spy in Germany. And in Germany, he was recruited to go by in England. Oh, wow. He had, he had no training whatsoever, <laughs> and he managed to get away with, uh, with, 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 you know, it was just a lot of trickery, and it was totally right, right. amazing, and, and, uh, and died a natural death. Right. And I want to talk to you about, about training. I did want to ask one other thing about, um, you said half of the curriculum was science yeah. and mathematics. In the United States, as, I mean, you've been here a long time now. You know yeah. that we don't do that in the United States. So, so yeah. I would like your insight, because you've seen both sides of the fence. I'd like your insight into the U.S. educational system compared to the Soviet educational system. I, I have a lot of uh, pre-digested thought in, in my head about this uh, because I, I have children here. Yes. So, and I'm familiar with the way the school system works. Uh, first of all, multiple choice, true and false exams, anathema should not be. Doesn't teach thinking, primarily teaches, the focus is on facts, fact, right. learning facts. And we're not teaching kids to think. And, and I, we, we didn't have a single test that was, you know, multiple choice or true and false essays or for when it was math, you know, you know, math, uh, math uh, tasks, you know, de deriving a formula or whatever, or, or solving something. Right. Um, and I think it, this has a lot to do with the, with the laziness of the teachers and teachers being afraid to make a judgment because the parents might come in and say, your judgment is off. Hey, listen, I just, I go, I, I have it, uh, I, I scored this by a computer. If, if the check mark is right, you know, you, you know, you, your kid gets another point. It's it's horrible. It's horrible. And and what we have now uh, is a uh, several generations already that don't know how to think. I agree. And some some of those are in government. Quite a few of them. <laughs> Quite a few of them. <laughs> so so as far as motivation, um, you know that 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 ump that drives the student. I'm assuming that. Russian students or, or Soviet students were much more motivated than what we see in the United States or not? Oh, yeah. No, I, I didn't go to school in the Soviet Union, but okay. the, the, their system was uh, very similar to ours, I, okay. uh, as I understand. And yeah, uh, I was naturally motivated, but I uh, my motivation was enhanced by my mother just like always looking at the grade and said, well, could, you could have done better, no? Wait a minute, I, I had a B, nobody else had a B, everybody else had C's and D's, so did they give out A's? <laughs> All so, right, so you had a good mom. <laughs> uh, in many respects, yes. Uh, okay. She also, she also uh, uh, laid the foundation for me to become independent. Nice. Uh, nice. Because she, at, uh, when, it, when, it, uh, when, when it came time to go to high school, I could have commuted to the nearest one that was the closest and everybody, all my classmates who went to high school went there. She put me into a boarding school uh, where I had to stay in, in the dorm, in the dorm uh, Monday through Saturday morning. Oh, wow. As, as a 14 year old. And, so, and yeah, she so, was going to make sure you were independent. It, yeah. And it, it, it set the theme for my life. I had no, uh, I had no problem moving away from home. And when it came time to uh, pick a college, I picked one that was the furthest away with regard to travel distance. So I couldn't go home other than just, uh, uh, I couldn't go home on the weekends. Uh, right. uh, I could go home for vacations and Christmas and so forth. So, so when everybody left uh, Saturday morning, I was 
by myself in the dorm. And of course, what did I do? I, I spent a lot of time studying. And, you know, and then if soccer season, I went to a soccer game and then in the evening to a student club. But um, I didn't have to be, you know, you know, back with mom. You know, that's 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 really interesting because, uh, again, I, I've got two stepsons and um, independent is not what I would call them by a long shot. Motivated. I would not label them as motivated either. Oh, uh, typically, I want to kill them about once a day. <laughs> <laughs> so, but, uh, you know, that that um, it floors me that that in the United States, our education system, as you said, it, it's about passing a standardized test, multiple choice, true, false essay, essay. What is that? Um, when I went to when I went to university, you know, a, a typical paper that we would write uh, underclassmen was, you know, 15 pages. These days I, I've got to, my two boys are in college. Um, a paper is three to five pages and it really isn't a very good paper. Um, so so this this idea of of Eastern Europe, Russia, that area being so much better at education is, is I don't think that that most Americans really understand that. Um, you know, we we growing up, you know, on, on the news, we saw videos of the of the bread lines. We saw videos of uh, how poor things were oh, yeah. in, in Eastern Europe. And uh, I'm assuming you know, now that I've you know matured, I'm assuming that all of that is propaganda. N not necessarily, no. Okay. I mean, uh, particularly in my early years, uh, this this improved uh, uh, rather significantly once I turned like 14. Uh, but in 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 my early years, um, I can't remember ever having gone hungry. But for maybe 10 years, I can't remember having had a good meal other than over Christmas. Oh, wow. And only that because my one of my grandparents was a forest ranger, so he he he, he shot wild animals and we got to eat them. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> actually, uh, he kept some illegally that was supposed to go to the government. And the the uh, the other grandfather uh, had had some some stock like pigs and chickens and so forth. But day to day. It was grub and it was not very tasteful. What we were fed in, in the cafeteria in school was like horrendous. And I have a picture of uh, self, too bad that I can't pull it out. It would take too long. Oh, but yeah, I'm fine. about uh, 12, 13 years old, old and I am as thin as a rail and I already grew pretty tall. I was like malnourished. So so that, that part is true, but uh, when I then wound up in Moscow, I was, I was already 24 years old the first time, uh, there were no more bread lines. Okay, you could get, get good bread on a daily basis. Now, what year was this? Uh, well, I was 26, so 49 plus 26, uh, 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 79, 75. Uh, 75. Okay. So, uh, does, that, does growing up like that, with, those, with, with the hardships... And, and, and so here's my thing. I, my thought process says that the, the, the Eastern Bloc people, they have a resilience yeah. and a strength yeah. that we in the West do not have because yeah. we in the West have not went through the stuff that they have went through. Yeah. And, and one of the things that uh, uh, I want to volunteer that, that also uh, – that contributed to that re resilience is a delayed deferred gratification. You can't have things right now. Right. Uh, you can have them when when it's time you know to eat, but not. And and so, for instance, uh, uh, when we went, it was a it was a, a custom when you travel by train, which could take hours. You take some sandwiches with you, and most people would just like immediately they sit down and start eating. I said, oh, no, I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to eat. No, I was already conditioned to wait. Right. And, and that is, and psycho, uh, psycho, psychology has proven that that's, that's a very important factor for being successful in life. Well, you know, that's, that's really interesting. I, I, I talked to um, my youngest, Carson. He's 19 and um, he's, he often fails. He, he's a very good kid. 
but he often fails because of that instant gratification. Mm-hmm. He wants it right then yep. instead of so. And, and you know, what I tell him is I'm like, hey, man, you're in college. This is your first year in college. Just buckle down. Do what you need to do for the next four to six, seven years. And at that point, you can start to get the things that you need. And it's 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 easier to say it than it is to uh, to have some of these some of these kids listen to it and actually put it into practice. Well, if I if I just may add on to this, uh, when it comes to my career in espionage, you know, when I came to the United States, I'm a very uh, at core, I'm very impatient. You know, I just want to get things done. But but again, de- delayed gratification. I did not uh, act aggressively uh, to pre- present myself as a born American. Okay. I eased into society. It took me five years to be comfortable to just mingle, freely mingle. So how long, how long were you an operative in the United States? Uh, a total of a little over 10 years, 10 years ten and a years. couple of months. Yeah. Okay. So, so you were recruited. What was your, what was your job? I mean, what, what was the, uh, the operation? Mm, yeah. So, uh, the answer may surprise you. Uh, there was only one job that was uh, clearly defined. Everything else was, let's see what we can do with that. And that, that was, you know, integrate into American society as a born American. In other okay. words, compared to uh, my colleagues, um, I would assume that most, if not all, were infiltrated uh, to the United States via another country Be- because of my ability to minimize the accent with which I speak. Uh, they they figured you know let's put him in as if he was born in the U.S. which which is sets you up uh, if you play your cards right you 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 can you can get elected you can you know be part of a government uh, right. not not that this was ever discussed but the point and there's just no suspicion oh well he came you know you know Brazil what, what did you you know how come you came out of Brazil and you became a legal U.S. citizen through immigration. But there's a little flag there, okay? And I didn't have that. So this was this was the number one task. You become an American. And I have to extend this a little bit because the plan then was, after about two years, I acquire the documentation. So I, I came to the U.S. with a, a certified copy of a birth certificate of Jack Barsky who passed away. Right. What was your name on uh, before that? My name, you know, unpronounceable for you, Albrecht Dietrich. You're right, unpronounceable. Yeah. <laughs> my, and by the way, my my daughter Chelsea, uh, she uh, changed her legal name to my German last name, and she can't pronounce. It. <laughs> <laughs> but okay. you know, it's uh, it's uh, it's a commitment to you know to who I really am or was at least. And in based on that uh, um, that birth certificate, I was uh, able to acquire, you know, your, your driver's license and a social security card, and and then the crown jewel was the passport, right? And the plan was, and this was still a specific plan that was sh- shared with me. You get that passport, and then you move. You move to Switzerland, ah, and you establish the co- you establish a company there, and we know how to. Uh, put funds into that company and you, you know, so you live there for a couple of years and then you move back to the United States okay. with whatever, $10 million in your, in your luggage, so to speak. Right. At that point, I would have been a very, very dangerous agent yeah. because it would, that money would have given me access to people of interest, decision makers, influencers. You know, I could have joined a a country club next to as close as possible to to the Pentagon. Right. Right. If it wasn't restricted to military and get to know a lot of people, because I I I now know I had the skills to to to, you know, be attractive to others and 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 make friendships. I didn't know it then, Uh, (laughs) you know, very often until until, you know, you live long enough. uh, and you get enough feedback, you don't you don't even know what your skills are. So, right. 
but but and and that thank God and and uh, the uh, the passport application was denied because of a de- mistake I made, and I'm so glad it was because you know I I wouldn't if this person were still alive who um, was suspicious uh, in in the passport office I would I would uh, thank him as well as I can say thank you to anybody right. for for denying that application because my life would have been very miserable. Let's say I could have wound up in jail or uh, when the wall came down, I would have realized that I had done damage to a country that I started loving in service of a country that was a big old lie. So I, I didn't have to go through all of that, thank God. So, so you come to the United States. What, did you, what kind of job did you have initially? Since I couldn't take my resume with me, right? You know, I, I had the equivalent of a master's degree in chemistry and I, I, I taught math, high level math in college, as well as chemistry for, for a couple of years. I couldn't take that with me. Uh, and uh, I had no record having worked in the US and, and according to the birth certificate, uh, Jack Barsky was born in 1944 and uh, I came here in 1978. Now do the math, how old was I? Uh, I think I was almost 30. Right, right. Okay. And at 30 with no work history, there were only certain types of jobs that you, that, that you, where they wouldn't ask you any questions. And I stumbled upon one of them and I got lucky, uh, um, after like doing research and, and finding out what they suggested in Moscow wouldn't work. I decided, you know, I've got to do messenger work. I, I thought that might be a way to go. And so one day I walked into an, an office um, and uh, luckily they had an ad in the newspaper and luckily the the fellow behind the counter looked at me and I, I must have looked somehow reasonably impressive compared to the other applicants. And he asked me, can you ride a bike? <laughs> or do you have a bike? I said, no, but I can get one and I know how to ride one. And immediately, instead of uh, being a messenger <clears throat> that got on foot, that got minimum wage, I became a commissioned messenger. Okay. And I got half of what the company charged to, to their customers. Because, it, you know, us bike messengers were the fastest uh, vehicle in, in all of Manhattan, right? right? And if something had to be delivered very quickly, it was us. You could, the cars got stuck and the, the people on foot had to take the subway or the bus. So, so and, and that and, uh, enabled me within a couple of months to move out of the single room occupancy hotel that I was in and rent an apartment. And you know the the uh, when I went back to Moscow uh, and about a year later for my biannual uh, return, uh, they were very impressed with. Uh, uh, and, and and when I told them how much I made annually, they wow you made that much money. <laughs> I did not know I did not need any any subsidies from the KGB anymore. Well, that's what, what I was going to ask if 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 they shot you any money from time to time or anything else like that. No, only only for my first return trip, okay. uh, travel money. I needed that. Uh, other than that, no. Uh, for my uh, the other return return trips, I uh, uh, I received passports because I had to. I can't. I couldn't. I couldn't. I didn't have a passport. And secondly, I wouldn't even if I had had one. I wouldn't uh, use my American passport to travel to Moscow. Right. So passports, but I paid for the trips myself and then I got refunds and the refunds piled up in Moscow in my savings account. You're over in Eastern Europe. You come to the United States. No accent, no language problems, anything like that? I had a couple of situations, maybe a handful of them, where people ask uh, asked questions about uh, what they perceived to be a European accent. And those were invariable, invariably either women women, or people who had, who had traveled to Europe or women who had traveled to Europe. Okay. And I had a very, very short, uh, excellent explanation 
because uh, on, on the birth certificate of Jack Barsky, the mother's maiden name is Schwartz. Okay. That, that is primarily Jewish, but it's, Schwartz is actually also German. So, uh, and uh, so in my backstory, we, we killed off my father when I was two years old. Uh, and, and, and then I grew up bilingual uh, with, you know, speaking German and English with my mother. And, and in New York, there is no better explanation than that because there's a lot of uh, individuals born right there in New York who speak with an accent, particularly right. Puerto Ricans, you know, out of Spanish Harlem. I had no concern with, with that little accent that I have that I still can hear when I hear, hear myself recorded. I really don't hear an accent. I, I've got you. that Eastern Kentucky accent, but I don't hear anything coming out of you. Out of oh, you. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> Let me ask you, uh, how long did it take you to learn English? And how did, how did you learn English? Well, okay, so I had school English and a little bit of college English, but, you know, but as you probably know, if you ever took another language in school, you, you lose it very quickly. Right. <clears throat> so when... When I uh, moved to Berlin for my training, one of uh, the items on that curriculum, which didn't exist, and it was just verbal, they're going to do this, 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 and this, uh, was I had to learn a foreign language um, and because it, they told me that's, <clears throat> that's a requirement and, <clears throat> and I was allowed to pick one. So I picked English because English, you know, in school, like it was a breeze for me. Right. So, but I started from scratch. So I, we, we took this, the, the beginner's book uh, from high school and I, I hired a tutor and I went through that very quickly. Then I changed tutors where, with whom I mostly had conversations and I did a phenomenal amount of reading. Initially, uh, newspapers, uh, you know, that have limited vocabulary. And I, every word that, I, that was new to me, I wrote down and I learned. I mean, I wound up uh, with a vocabulary that was probably maybe 30,000 words, way too many. <laughs> you know why I'm saying way too many? We it, only it, use about, what, 200 words a day? We, <laughs> but, yeah. Be, 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 well, because English has a lot of, uh, uh, at least American English has a lot of synonyms. Right. And, and if you learn, you know, the one synonym that is like, the least used and you use it, people looking at you, what did you, you just say? That happened to me quite a bit. More, more so than the accent thing. <clears throat> uh, but, you know, I, <clears throat> I, uh, I know because I kept track, I learned 100 new words every day. 100? Yeah, 100. And, and how do I know it? I had a system uh, by which I could track it. I, put, uh, I used index cards and I used uh, a promotional system. So, uh, you know, I had, I had levels, one through five. Right. Level one is the new word, if, and and on day on day one I'm looking at the the German, and if I know the English, it goes to two, and on and on. If if I don't remember the English, it goes back to one level below. And if if I know level five, I put it into the archive because then I'm pretty sure I I, I know that word and I count it as a, as a new newly acquired word. It took about um, a year and a half for me to learn uh, to read. Uh, you know, English novels without without a dictionary. That's not I mean, bad. I was I was That's passively impressive. fluent, and I could have a decent conversation. And when they found the when when Moscow found that out, they uh, put me on a plane to on my first my first flight to Moscow to be screened by two ladies. One was a, a professor of English, a Russian taught English, at Moscow University. Obviously, she was part-time professor and full-time KGB. And the other one was a born American. And uh, they they were asked to screen me to see if I could pose as a born American. And the the Russian was pessimistic, but the American, you know, Americans are very optimistic. She said, yeah, I, I, can, I can teach them. I think it's gonna be fine. So, okay. so, so then I spent another two years uh, working on on American culture, on my American accent, and also through the conversation that I had with this uh, tutor, I met her every uh, twice a week, and eventually also had uh, the opportunity uh, once a week to meet a American-born couple, 
they were they were rather famous. Uh, uh, Morris and Lana Cohen, they uh, uh, were members of the Rosenberg spy ring. Right, right. Uh, so anyway, and all of this eventually got me to a point where the accent was not a problem. What was a problem, which I didn't know until I came to the U.S., that I culturally it was totally unprepared. Okay. I so, so, and, and I want to talk about that, that culture shock. Um, I'm assuming that the background in chemistry and mathematics is what lends to what you've described as a very methodical, analytical approach to learning English. Yeah, yeah. Uh, absolutely right. Uh, but again, it, it was also my obsession uh, at, at being the best at what I'm doing. Right. Okay, that was, and that that has never stopped. That that's now whether that's genetically imprinted or not, it doesn't matter. But I I, I can't do sloppy things. I hate sloppiness, you know. I don't blame you. And uh, I I I'm mostly a perfectionist, but I also know how to when when I when I want to get something done and it needs to be done, I know how to cut corners as well. So. Okay. You, you mentioned uh, you were not prepared for the U.S. culture. Yeah. Talk to me about that. Well, I knew nothing about baseball, football. <laughs> I, I knew nothing about American television. You know, the one, the one time the KGB gave me a video to watch, one video was uh, an American movie that was made in the, the 40s where they spoke stage English. I mean, it was a, it was astounding. They should have taped soap operas, and allow me to watch a soap opera because soap operas a don't have musical back uh, uh, don't don't have a lot of musical background, so you can really understand the language as it's spoken. And b, it's it's about daily life things. Right. You know, you see people like doing dishes, uh, cooking food, and all that. I mean. This this is this was so darn stupid, and I think the bottom line, uh, the the reason for for the lack of uh, preparation is uh, uh, the folks that were supposedly training me didn't know what they didn't know. They they thought they were experts in the American way of life because they had been in the United States as agents under diplomatic cover. Okay. Yeah, okay, so that means you speak to Americans, but you don't live right. like an American. Okay, and you don't pay attention to those little things such as, you know, how Americans count uh, with their fingers, and I still mm -hmm. can't do it. Like this? Right. And and Europeans start with a thumb. Right. And and on and on and on, but, you know, and the the uh, my job as a messenger, actually, I lucked out just because it, I, I didn't... Uh, uh, cho cho choose that job be because I would learn, you know, how America, what is important to Americans. So I was sitting in the office and I could just listen to the conversation, you know, what, what they were watching. You know, how about those Yankees and on and on and on. And, and that, uh, that took quite a while to, and I, you know, I started watching American football initially. It was like, oh my God, this is terrible. You know, <laughs> as a European, you know, and put all these timeouts and, and <laughs> inter interrupted play in soccer. There's, there's always action except for halftime. Right, right. Okay. Uh, and, and I, and I played basketball in, in college in Germany. So the, this, the one thing I knew pretty well was basketball, you know, the, and, uh, and I enjoyed watching that. My my first trip to Madison Square Garden was to see the Harlem Globetrotters oh. because they were legend. I don't know if they still are, but they were legend even in East Germany. I was I was very fortunate to be able to see them back in the in the late seventies, and I don't know if they still are or not. Uh, do you think that that your handlers? Uh, uh, you said that they they thought they knew American culture. Do yeah. you think that they were interested in actually knowing American culture, or were they in their own little echo chambers? Well, their very existence uh, made it very difficult to to really find out what it's like to be an American because they had their families with them. They lived in a compound, and you know, when it was a gated community uh, where they where all the diplomats 
and their families lived right. in in the north of Manhattan. So the only time they would mingle with uh, with others if they you know were trying to get close to somebody, possibly recruit them or run them, or go to a bar and have a conversation. And that's about it. Okay. Right. Uh, so did they have an interest? I don't know. They, they were really comfortable. I mean, they were they could other than us illegals. We were the elite of the elite. But okay. but the most coveted job for KGB agents was to go to the United States. And so they, they were they were already established. And when they when they came back home, either just for vacation or or for like when when a two year or four year stint had ended, they very, very uh, proudly uh, displayed all the wonderful clothing that they were able to buy while in the United States. Lots of Levi's. Levi's and uh, I mean, nice coats, leather, leather, leather jackets and stuff like that. Yeah. Oh, Levi's. Levi's were at a premium. Right. As a matter of fact, when <laughs> in, in college, uh, my friend and I, uh, uh, one, one summer, hitchhiked uh, for like three weeks uh, from East Germany all the way down to the Bal uh, not the, to the Black Sea in Bulgaria. Mm -hmm. And uh, I needed a sturdy set of pants. And there was one fellow student who owned a pair of Levi's. I borrowed the Levi's from him. <laughs> <laughs> what, was the, uh, what was the biggest culture shock for you coming to the United States? Well, the, the biggest culture shock was, was already over with because... Uh, that that started out when I uh, went uh, had my first trip to West Berlin on the other side of the Berlin Wall, and what I immediately what struck me, and people who had similar experiences uh, also going the other way, uh, the 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 whole city looked different, and I could describe it nowadays. It's uh, East Germany, East Berlin was uh, a black and white movie. And in the West, they had color. Ah. Everything was painted nice and different colors and much more attractive. And you had a better feeling about being there. And then I had a, a, a three month uh, practice trip to Canada, spent quite a bit some time in, uh, in, in Montreal. <clears throat> and I had the opportunity to actually, you know, go to malls and see the variety of what of, of what you could buy there. It's amazing. And what, what you know, for some reason, I still remember, uh, probably because I had a problem when I had my own apartment in Berlin, I was looking for a nice rug to put on the floor, on the wooden floor. And they were so hard to come by. They were all like standard, like gray or brown or whatever. Right. And I was so at the, at the department store in, in, in Montreal, I was just blown away by the variety of rugs and uh, and carpets. <laughs> so so that part of the shock was done and over with. I expected uh, a lot of richness, and uh, and I found it, and that didn't bother me. Uh, okay. And yeah, pretty much there, there is not even a caveat to that statement. Okay. Okay. Uh Tradecraft. What type of, uh, and you've talked about that to, to a degree, but how does the KGB teach someone to be an operative? Yeah, and well, in for most everybody, that was in classes. For instance, Vladimir Putin, you, you went, with, went to a class with other people. Okay. Okay, us. Simply because, and I, I'm guessing this in hindsight, the moment I, I was tapped to become uh, an illegal, I became a state secret of the Soviet Union. So I could not be known by uh, too many people. And so all the training was one on one. And uh, I was always introduced by my cover name. And uh, most likely the people that trained me also they wouldn't tell me their name either. So the, the KGB was very good at keeping those uh, those secrets. And so one-on-one -on -one training. Um, and the, I tell you, the tradecraft training was excellent, uh, just like the, the, 
total opposite of the uh, the limited cultural training I got, right? Okay. Or or psychological training, I got none either. Nothing, not even you know, like <laughs> I just got to volunteer this. Uh, the the only cultural and behavioral training I got was uh, when one of the agents uh, one day put a book in, on my desk, uh, uh, Dale Carnegie, How to Win Friends and Influence People. <laughs> well, at least, you know, I was I was too immature to really digest this. Right. Uh, and so recently I read it again. I said, man, this... I, I acquired a lot of these skills by, you know, by you know, making, you know, by trial and error, so to speak, right? Uh, but anyway, um, so I, I digressed a little bit. Oh, training. So the the uh, um, the tradecraft training, uh, it started out with, because that took a while, uh, I had to learn how to, how to uh, listen to Morse code and write down uh, the digits we 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 were limited to digits because all that code was enc encrypted and uh, the decryption encryption worked with m basic mathematical algorithms so you okay. add some digits and then you subtract some whatever so then I had to learn uh, a, uh, a method to uh, decrypt manually decrypt uh, uh, encrypted messages um, I don't know if you know what a one-time pad is. I do. A, a lot of encryption uh, goes with one-time pads, uh, but but I was taught to develop the digits that you find on, on a one-time pad through an algorithm. Okay. And I I had this initial algorithm, and then I was told it was good for about uh, 400 uses before it could could be deciphered, and then right. I had to learn another one. And then my last two years, there was no time to learn a third one. So then they gave me a one-time pad. Okay. Um, so obviously, so I also had to learn how to, you know, uh, the short, how to man manipulate a shortwave radio. So there was a lot of there was, we, there was a lot of practice that we did there. Uh, secret writing. There was a uh, very. Uh, very methodical ritual to uh, put secret writing on a piece of paper. You had to be really clean, you know, no smudge. You had to work uh, with a clean surface, um, a mirror or a, a pane of glass that had to be cleaned. And then uh, you, I was supposed to wear gloves, but I didn't like gloves. But I made sure that that then wouldn't I would any, anything I touched I've touched like this no fingerprints right and then you start writing uh, you know you take you take your sheet of paper like you know stationary and you write an open text dear so and so and you pretend you you know the person that you're writing to and then when that's done you take out this the contact paper that uh, uh, it was a Again, it was stationary, but that was bought at uh, what was then the equivalent of Walmart. Uh, it was uh, Woolworths, right? And uh, and a few pages of that stationery were in, um, impregnated with a trace of a chemical. That when you then with a, a, a type two pencil, you 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 put this on the receiving page and you put it on top, put another page and then you write your message and you print that message in relatively large letters so that it would leave a trace on the receiving page. Okay. Uh, I was told that unless somebody knew what they were looking for, they could not find that this contact uh, page had something odd on it. it right. was, so and I saw and I saw that once they showed me a developed page, and no matter and I the, the other thing, even you know putting pressure on with uh, with your hands, wasn't any good. And even though I was very careful, I saw a developed page. It was it was readable, but there was a lot of smudge uh, that that I generated by putting just a little bit of pressure. So that that was. Uh, 
spent I spent a lot of time, but the most time I spent is uh, on surveillance detection. Ah, I was going to ask about that. How how yeah. do you avoid detection? How do you train for that? Uh, <clears throat> first of all, the the prerequisite is you need to get to know the city. So I spent when I was in Moscow when when surveillance detection uh, was. Uh, uh, w- one of the most important things I studied there in Berlin, the fellow who was, who was my 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 coach, didn't know much about it. Okay, so he didn't teach me. He taught taught me the basics. In Moscow, uh, there, it was serious, and I was trained by a guy who was was the head of the, the department that uh, uh, ran teams that would surveil foreigners, uh, suspected agents, and so forth. So he, he, he was the expert. Right. So he told me, you got to get to know the city. So, you know, I, I took the subway to every station and walked around there to find spots where I could uh, reasonably maneuver myself into a position that I can see the face of somebody who is following me. Okay. All right. Now, and, uh, some, some of them are obvious, you know, you go in, in, into a building with an elevator and uh, you, you wait until there's only one person left because they, they have, see the, the surveillance uh, team is an, anywhere between seven and eight individuals. Right. One of them has to be close enough so they can see at all times what you're doing. Because, because they may some, miss a handoff. There are some, uh, operations that take no more than a couple of seconds, like, a, you know, what a brush pass. pass right. is. So I have something in a newspaper, uh, maybe a, a document, and I go around the corner and there's like another guy coming at me and I just like, we exchange newspapers, by the way. So when I'm back in sight, uh, nothing happened. But they, so they have to come really close to, to avoid uh, being victimized by such actions. And so, for instance, you, uh, I liked also the Museum of Natural History, where you can wander around and turn this way and that way with, without, without giving evidence that you are engaged in surveillance detection, because that was very important. You cannot turn. You cannot even walk towards a display window of a department store to see who's following you, <laughs> because immediately that's... That's not necessarily proof, right. but it's indication that, uh, you know, I am an active agent or criminal, whatever. Uh, Museum of Natural History and in, in, in large drug stores where you can walk around and here and go here and there. And my, my favorite spot uh, of all times, I thought that was brilliant. And I, I every time I used that, I, I caught somebody. Uh, uh, there was a pretty deserted street with a sidewalk and it went down the hill, made a left uh, curve. So, and uh, at the bottom of the hill, there was a telephone booth. And you, the, the, the door was on the far side. You open the door, you walk in and you, you have to turn around 180 degrees because the phone was that away. And I, I caught, I caught the, the person who followed me every time. <laughs> Uh, so uh, and and one funny episode where I, I got fooled. You know, I by the way, and uh, we we conducted about seven or eight exercises to simulate reality when people were following me. Right. And this was a contest. They they wanted to win their contest. I beat them every time. They are <laughs> at a significant surveillance is at a significant disadvantage uh, when it comes to a well-trained agent. But this one time I got fooled. So I'm standing at a, at a, a bus stop and uh, you know, there's about you know, maybe seven, eight people there. And this one fellow comes up to me and asked me for a cigarette. Now that was normal. In, in those days, cigarettes were dirt cheap. So it right. was okay to ask somebody, can, can I have a cigarette? I gave him a cigarette and I lit the c- cigarette. And I was told that uh, he actually was one of the surveillance team <laughs> because I he, he, this was very clever of him. I immediately removed him from the list of suspects. Right, right. <laughs> but it was a contrary uh, kind of contrary behavior. So that was uh, that was a, a lot. I also uh, 
um, had some some training in visual observation uh, of of like ships out of a distance. Okay. What kind of a ship I would be looking at? Because when I was in New York to visit occasionally, you see if there are signs that that the U.S. is preparing for war. Okay. And I understand in hindsight that every agent who was in a foreign and NATO country had the same task because Andropov was certain that Ronald Reagan would start a nuclear war. I okay, mean, so so that kind of training. And you know, little things, how to how to burn a piece of paper with the least amount of smoke and stuff like, stuff like that. Uh, um, I'm going to stop here because it gets too much into detail. If you no, no, you're you're fine. Uh, so so you were an operative for ten years, and please forgive me for approaching this subject, but you were you had a wife and child back in Germany or not? Yeah, there's nothing to forgive. I mean, okay. it's in the book, right? And, right. And, and that's the one, the fact that I eventually uh, deserted that, that woman who I love dearly um, is something, uh, it's, it's, it's the worst part of my entire life, really, right. because uh, she, she was waiting for me to come back home. And when I didn't, uh, she... She became a very private person. Let's put it this way. She, she, her garden, and now the grandchild that I have, uh, but never had a uh, serious companionship again. Never had it again? No, no. That's a, um, that's a really tough pill to swallow. Yes, it is, particularly um, based on who I am today, I would never do something like that but you know you, you need to understand the dilemma I was in because right. it was love versus love right and and the and the one that I deserted didn't need my support to have a good life she had a good life she I mean she she benefited from from uh, the treatment that I got she she drove the the best vehicle you could get in East Germany. She had a telephone, a private telephone that was a rarity, and she didn't have to work. Okay. Okay. So she was able to raise our son, and even when I left, I mean, she, she was fine, always. Uh, the person I left her for would not have been fine. Right. Because she was this uh, eighteen-month-old girl with a mother who had only four years worth of schooling. If I leave these two, uh, they will wind up in a slum. And, That's a um... and uh, and the the, the the life that my daughter Chelsea was able to live, she was able to live because of me. Right. That's a um, like I said. It's, it's that I can't imagine how hard that decision is. It was hard, and uh, you at the beginning, I, I think it was may have been even before the the, the taping started. I uh, know it was during the interview. Uh, you you uh, mentioned that you know with a scientific background, I I would be very methodical in in analyzing things and and going about like learning English, for instance. I tried to be very methodical to uh, figure out that decision: leave, stay, and literally it was a tie and actually it was a tie only because my emotions were with the with the child but but uh it I really my my analysis did not result in a decision the decision was made by my subconscious right and i i am now convinced as i'm as i've been paying attention to how I make decisions, important decisions, and all of us make like decisions like this. Where did it come from? It doesn't, you know, when, when I drive a, a car and there's uh, somebody sort of cutting me off and I have to hit the brakes, I, I don't analyze the situation. I just hit the damn brake. Right. <clears throat> so where does it come from? The, the subconscious is always like operating and, and that decision to stay <clears throat> was illogical because you know, with, with regard to you know benefits, everything that was good for me would have been back in East Germany. Right. Because the wall was still up, and we had uh, they promised me a house. Uh, 
I had dollar savings. I would have been a wealthy East German, and I would, and I, and I had received the. Uh, I'm going to bring show it to you. Uh, that is the second high, highest decoration of the uh, of the Soviet Union. You oh see wow! All of the red banner. And uh, so I would have I would have gone back as a as a hero. Yeah. And I would have continued to do a little work for the KGB, you know, one offs, you know, a couple of weeks, uh, maybe just one meeting and stuff like that, because I was such a well trained agent and and I had survived 10 years. So I was a huge asset and and uh, staying back in the U.S., they thought I was going to be arrested by the FBI. They had had a reason to tell me that they had to be taken somewhat seriously, even though I had no indication that I was uh, being uh, investigated, you know, right. because of my skills in surveillance detection and so forth. And and then if I couldn't convince them that my refusal to go back wasn't a defection, that would have caused, uh, uh, would have put me in danger of maybe retribution. So again, the the decision was logically totally wrong for me, for my my own and my own well being, and for my the rest of my quote unquote good life. And uh, that is when I nowadays come to the conclusion. I have proof in my life that like love love is the strongest human emotion, and and there's nothing. Nothing that ultimately, if you are truly in love and, and uh, uh, unconditionally in love with somebody, there's there's nothing that will override that love. I agree. I absolutely agree. And there are people who sacrifice their life to uh, uh, for loved ones. Right. I didn't have to, but I it, I could have ended up that way. I don't know. So. So you you make the decision to stay in the United States. Yep. I can't imagine that your handlers took that very well. Well, they they were disappointed, but because uh, of my brilliant lie, uh, they weren't angry. Okay. Because I I came up with this uh, with this brilliant lie when 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 I eventually I had to tell them, you know, I'm not I'm not coming back. And I uh, told him that I had c- contracted HIV AIDS. Ah. And to make this really credible, I also uh, shared with them how I got the AIDS. And so I, 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 it was a requirement to uh, report on everybody I had a, 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 like a friendship with or a relationship, a girlfriend. So I, I, I told him that in, in my last letter in secret writing, I, I wrote that, you know, she gave it to me because she once had a boyfriend who was a drug addict. So, so that made it even more credible. They bought it. Right. <clears throat> they went to my German family and told them that I died from AIDS. Ah, okay. okay. Yeah. And the, the, I don't know what they call it, the, the East German files, the social security register or whatever it is, they, have uh, I wish Dietrich has uh, having passed away in 1988. Uh, a German news magazine found it. Wow. So, so they tell your first wife that you passed away. Yeah. So she doesn't have, there's no retribution toward her at all. Mm-hmm. And that was a concern as well. If I defect my, my family, they, you know, they wouldn't put him in jail, but, you know, all the privileges that they had would have been taken away from. Right. From yep. Wow. So 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 because of that, she continues to be taken care of, right? Uh, they they handed her half of my dollar savings. And that was okay. that was pretty good. I don't know what else uh, they did for her. Probably that was the end of that relationship. But. OK. Okay. But but you know to in East Germany to to have to uh, have about uh, three hundred thousand U.S. dollars. <laughs> you're doing pretty good. <laughs> oh my God! <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you're doing all right. <laughs> did uh, uh, so you stayed in the United States? Did did the FBI ever contact? 
Well, yeah, obviously, if they didn't, I wouldn't be talking right. to you today, right? Uh, I, I was, con- I was not. Well, let me rephrase it in a positive, make a positive statement. Uh, uh, I was determined not to uh, turn myself in, okay, because I was concerned what what would happen to me, but also my family. I had uh, then another child, and we had a pretty good life. You know, my career in corporate America took off, and at one point, you know, I I made so much money that I told my my wife, uh, the mother of uh, uh, Chelsea, that I don't know what to make do with all that money. <laughs> I don't need that much. But anyway, uh, so I was convinced that I would, you know, live out the rest of my life in in the shadows, so right. to speak. Never go back to Germany, and. I had settled on that idea that, and then I would never like be able to tell the truth as I know it, uh, which eventually when I did, it, it was, uh, uh, it was a significant purge and it really right. helped me to, to figure out who I was, you know, because I stopped living the lie. But so how did FBI um, people ask, how, how did they find out? And there's another person who I'm very grateful for by the name of Vasily Matrokin, who was an archivist in, in the KGB, in, in the directorate as the illegals, and he had access to every single file there. And when he eventually, uh, and he had uh, developed a deep hatred for the Soviet state, I don't know I don't, I don't have any information exactly how that happened, uh, but, but he just wanted to do damage to the Soviet Union. And the, the only way that he could figure out is to, to, to collect information. And he wrote things down on small pieces of paper and smuggled them out in his underwear and his socks. Oh, wow. And when he, and then he took him to his dacha where he transcribed this with a tape writer and eventually buried the stuff with the resulting information uh, in his dacha, and uh, 1992, after the Soviet Union was already not in existence anymore, he uh, approached MI6, British intelligence, and they managed to get the stuff out of the dacha and smuggle him, him uh, across the border and into the free world. And this was arguably the biggest stash of secret information ever collected from a from a hostile intelligence agency. Uh, a lot of agents that there were illegals in other countries, and a lot of them were Russians. And since they were Russians, they most likely continued to work for Russia. I I wouldn't have because you know my allegiance wasn't to Russia. Right. It wasn't even to the Soviet Union. It was to the socialist cause, and I was a East German patriot. Right. Uh, so, uh, yeah, and, and as part of that, that stash of information, there were a couple of sentences. It says, Jack Barsky, illegal, lives in the northeast of the United States. Now, since Barsky is n- not a very common name, uh, the FBI didn't have much of a problem finding me. When they, when they looked at the Social Security documentation, they found the one Barsky that uh, acquired his social security number at the age when he was already in his 30s. Aha, right. uh-huh. we, we got our man. And then they spent, uh, I think, two and a half years watching me. Okay. Uh, simply because they wanted to find out whether uh, I was still active. There was a lot of concern that, that uh, there might still be additional moles. In those days, there were there were two active moles in, in the uh, in, the, in the U.S. government, CIA and FBI, actually, uh, Aldrich Ames and uh, right. Robert Hansen. Were and, you aware and, that you were being uh, investigated? You were talking about surveillance detection. No, not at all. You okay. know, I, I had forgotten that I ever was an agent. I did nothing. You know, I was I was free and clear after after three months of uh, having uh, sent this goodbye letter to the KGB. I determined everything's fine. Within a year, we bought a house in the suburbs. No, no, there was no more. You know, I, there was no paranoia, no fear, nothing. I was, I was in the clear. So when they, 
you know, said hello, introduced themselves. That was a big surprise. <laughs> <laughs> so, so introduced themselves, never charged with anything. I assume not. Uh, you assume you assume correctly. Okay. I was also not arrested. I was right. just detained for two hours for an introductory talk, and then they let me go home. Okay. All right. But but they the operation was very well prepared. They had a, a whole bunch of people with weapons stationed everywhere that could be a, a route for me to escape. <laughs> uh, you know, they, uh, because they didn't know yet that I wasn't active anymore, they had to take that precaution. Had they known uh, my, my, how my life proceeded, they would have known that I had nowhere, no place to go. Right. Right. There was no reason for me to even consider going where to the United Germany, right? Uh, Russia, no. You know, I, I had succeeded in what I had succeeded wildly in what the KGB wanted me to do of become an American. Right. I was a, right. Other than documentation wise, I was uh, intellectually and emotionally already an American. Did you? Uh, um, did your family stateside know? What you were doing and who you were? No. Okay. Uh, I once um, shared this with my wife, who who was arguing with me a lot, and I tried to explain to her that I'm on her side, so I'm not trying to dominate her and whatever. But to, so, and I and I gave and I told her that uh, you know. As, uh, proof that I love you and and Chelsea is that I I was a KGB agent and uh, I uh, I stayed with you because uh, when they wanted me back home I don't think she believed it <laughs> she believed it when the FBI showed up one day and said yeah that that's the true story and at that point she became paranoid ah she was she already started paranoid but that, at that point she uh, her distrust in in others uh, was ex became exponential she thought i was lying to her all the time she thought i, I was uh, having affairs with tons of women she actually um investigated me she went through through my phone my laptop and so forth and that uh, that really uh, that's another thing that uh you know this agency it's a, what you call detritus, what was left over, you know, the, the, the damage that was done was to two women. Right. Uh, both were uh, emotionally weak and were, you know, a stronger, a stronger woman would have been able to handle that, this particular situation. But uh, so, and that eventually wound up in a divorce. So, yeah. And, and so in the, in the, the afterword of my book, the agent who was the lead, the FBI lead on my case, uh, starts the afterword saying that it is nearly, uh, it is fundamentally impossible to do this the kind of work that Jack did without some some damage, right? Doing uh, being done to others as well as self, right? And yeah, Jack. Um... I, I'm 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 floored by the story. I am, um, so, and you go on after this to be. Uh, I mean, you've got several careers after this, and today you're speaking. Yeah. What's the? Um, and I I know you you're close on time here too. What's the um, for Jack Barsky? What's the life lesson? What's the uh, what's the takeaway that you that really resonates with you these days? How much time you got? Uh, <laughs> I just uh, I just uh, taped a masterclass uh, under the uh, title uh, Applied Spycology. You get the title. Uh, I do. So and and there's a lot of there's this this big macro lesson, the biggest the you know the heading, and I already stated that love conquers all. Right. And uh, and I, I got to a point just very recently that when people would ask me, well, you know, you're a Christian, uh, you're supposed to love everybody. Could you love Hitler? 
I said, no, I couldn't love what he was doing, but I would still treat him with love, treat him with right. love because it's about what's in here. It's not about the other person. Right. I agree so, with that. So um, that's, that's, the, that's the biggest lesson. Uh, and then there's a lot of lessons how to behave, how, how, to, how to actually, uh, you know, the lesson that I, that I learned from my recent, recent uh, 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 broken up marriage, how, how I could have actually prevented that from falling apart. I, I, uh, I am, I've been living my life in the last few years, years uh, very, very, very uh, in, intently and 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 up observing self and others there's more lessons co having come out of the last five six years of my life since i was able to go in public and share myself and share who i am right. than i learned in the past but i learned a lot of things also with regard to uh, you know during my spy years i give you one example um um handling very complex tasks in in this i give my example is when i uh my trip from moscow my first trip from moscow to new york which went through multiple cities multiple countries i traveled with different passports i met agents in different places to exchange passports and and uh and i had a ton of information stored in my head that was necessary you know uh for me to operate, like meeting places, uh, uh, frequencies, uh, times, I think lots and lots of information, overwhelming, for particularly for the for the first uh, big task of a rookie agent. Right. So this is what I did, and it, it was instinctive, but it, it it works for can work for everybody in real life. I I, I call this execution mode. So I had, I had, I planned, this is when I planned it, I had. So I'm going here, I'm going there. Uh, then I meet this guy. What if something goes wrong? So I broke up uh, the entire lengthy task into scenes, like movie scenes. Okay. And walked through the scene in my head. So I had, uh, I had ideas, uh, pre-digested ideas that what I would do if something went haywire. All right. And the moment the door, the side door that I was let into uh, the uh, the departure hall at uh, Sherrod Mitchell of Moscow Airport, the moment it closed behind me, it was just me and my luggage and what I had in here. And so at that point, this is when I went into execution mode. I only focused on the next step. Right. What, what do I have to do from here to go from here to there? No more what ifs. No more big picture. And you know, you you can you can apply that, that methodology. So so the big things that you you that you uh, do in life, for instance, for women particularly when they plan a wedding. <laughs> That's that's how you that's how it doesn't scare you. That's how you don't go, go crazy. So I appreciate that. Let, let, so I, I want to close things out by asking just a, a few questions. Yeah, um, go ahead. In your opinion, what's the number one intelligence agency on the planet? I believe it's it may well be a tie, uh, the Mossad and, and Cuban intelligence. Cuban intelligence. I, yeah, I you, hadn't know even why, you know why Cuban intelligence is, uh, is has been that successful? No. Because because uh, you know they can infiltrate the Spanish speaking community in of the United course. States. You know they can they can they can bring illegals over here no problem. Right. Right. And That's I have right. a I have a friend who uh, who worked for the CIA and he operated in Cuba and he. He he would agree with that statement that I just made. You know, these are educated guesses. You right, know, there's right, no right. way to measure the success. You know, right. and at one point the KGB was uh, that, that was before the Cold War, and maybe into the Cold War. But you know, when they managed to steal the atomic secret, mm -hmm. that was the biggest winner in the history of intelligence. Right. 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 
Uh, but so, okay, next question. Um, Vladimir Putin. <laughs> good agent, better politician or not? Uh, he was not never a good agent. Okay. <laughs> so first, uh, and, and there's evidence, uh, there's indirect evidence and there's, uh, there is some direct evidence and then there is, uh, there's an eyewitness. In, uh, so let's start with the indirect evidence. Uh, uh, Vladimir Putin was deployed in East Germany. The, the best agents were not deployed in a in a uh, in a uh, al- allied country, right? They they were deployed where the espionage happened, like may, maybe in in East Berlin, maybe, but in right. Austria, Switzerland. He spoke German really well, so no, he he was a he was a bureaucrat and liaison, so to speak, to East German intelligence. Now, that's indirect evidence. Direct evidence. He applied to become, and that's on the record, he applied to become an illegal and he was denied. Ah. And the witness is uh, a fellow named Oleg Kalugin. Oleg Kalugin was uh, at one point in charge of counterintelligence for the first directorate that was espionage directorate. And, And Vladimir Putin reported to him and I met Oleg Kalugin, and he he told me straight out that he was not very impressed with uh, uh, Vladimir Putin. Having said that, he is arguably the most skilled politician that we've had in the last 100 years in the world. I would agree. The, the fact Absolutely. that he has been able to survive in a country where there hasn't been much progress in terms of the standard of living, and uh, the fact that he has not lost the support of the majority of Russians in this war, where there's thousands of uh, people people coming dead, uh, back, back as corpses, soldiers, and standard of living has actually been going down, it makes him, you know, just like incredibly successful with regard to managing his his own population. And he's right. manipulating to uh, to some extent the rest of the world. I mean, that interview with uh, Tucker Carlson was a, a phenomenal example. How he dominated uh, right. one person who should have like been able to hold his ground, and he really didn't. Tucker made a fool of himself. Yeah, I agree, oh, Tucker. I like you, but. <laughs> <laughs> I like him too. <laughs> I'm not going to say anything bad about him. I, so listening to your story, listening to, uh, I mean, the entire arc of what you've talked about today, it occurs to me that a gentleman by the name of Yuri Bezmianov oh, may have yeah, been a no, fraud. You're bringing, you're bringing this, this guy up. Uh, <laughs> why, why did you have to ask that question? Because I'll tell you why. Because a lot of people put a lot of faith in that guy. And after yeah. talking to you, I don't. Yeah, of course not. Uh, Okay. First of all, everybody who knows anything about the KGB uh, will tell you that what the KGB was really good at was compartmentalization. In other words, if there was a secret to uh, that was important to to not have leaked, Mm -hmm. uh, they they did everything possible to to limit the number of people that uh, that know about that secret. Okay. Now, Bezmenov shared with the Americans, the gullible Americans, a master plan to undermine the United States. Yes, he did. Now, if, if such a master plan existed, then uh, the guy who was a volunteer for the KGB in India wouldn't have possibly known about it. No way. Right. Secondly, such master plan was based on what I told you about what the Americans did. Uh, the, the, uh, Soviets didn't know how this American society operates. Uh, based on that ignorance, they couldn't have developed such a master plan. Right. They, they were incapable of doing that. So, bottom line, Bezmenov what was, I think he may not be with us anymore. He was a really, really smart guy who came up with a bunch of lies that actually that plan, uh, if, if that was in existence, would have worked really well. I mean that, that you got to give him credit for that. You have to give him credit. That's true. And and he uh, he he he, uh, he he knew the about the gullibility of Americans ex- 
especially the extreme anti-communist, anti-socialist uh, uh, portion of uh, Americans and pol the politicians right. and journalists and so forth. So I've been asked that question many times. And actually, Patrick <laughs> Bet-David, Patrick, uh, I love you too, but he argued with me in, it, in front of a live audience. Oh, jeez. Well, I'm not going to argue because after talking to you, I'm like, now nah, this guy, excuse my language, this guy's full of shit, this Besmian <laughs> office. <laughs> Besmianoff for sure. But, but uh, you know, it's uh, Americans are just, uh, when it comes to history and foreign affairs and intelligence, unfortunately quite non-naive which makes right. it very vulnerable i've got uh, i got one more question i want to ask yes, um i'm a huge fan of um well a, a huge fan of the book gulag archipelago um uh -huh. and recently we we saw the uh, the death of alexei yeah. Navalny. would you comment on that for me yeah, it's uh, um, Navalny was a very complex personality, um, and obviously Putin is a complex personality. Uh, initially, when you when you look at the history of the relationship, quote unquote, relationship between the two of them, initially Navalny, when he got into politics, he started out m more or less on the right wing, and then moved more in, in the direction of democracy, liberalism, right, and didn't get much traction. So Putin probably treated him as a useful idiot. You know, we have uh, we have, uh, you know, opposition here. They, they, they're free to do what the opposition does. But in any of the elections, whether they were municipal or, uh, you know, oblast, that, that means region or even national, uh, Navalny didn't get any more than 20% of the votes. Oh, wow. Okay. Now, when he became a real pain in the neck to Putin is when, when he started uh, uh, uncovering corruption in the Russian government. Uh, initially, it was at the mid and uh, low mid, mid level. But, but his prison sentences, initially they were 10 days, 20 days, then they were overturned, and then it was a month. And, you know, this was all a game that, you know, he, he, he didn't know that he was actually serving Putin, Putin's cause by, by, you know, playing that game with him. Right. But when he became dangerous, the prison sentences were longer, and all of a sudden, he wound up uh, in in this place in Siberia. Right. Um, I had a thought, and I, I I have to think about this now. When when he knew that he was a target, Navalny is when when he was poisoned, and right. it was became clear there was Novichok, so there was no doubt this was it was ordered by Vladimir Putin. Why in the world he went back? to Russia it was beyond me. There is a, uh, there, he must have been in, uh, internally a martyr, uh, sort of. I mean, he uh, had to have known how that, how it was going to end. Absolutely. At that point. And, and maybe just, he was working, you never know, maybe he was working on his legacy and hoping that his, his death would uh, wake up the Russian people. Well, Vladimir Putin has been doing everything to prevent that because he, he wants to put him in a grave that's unmarked and nobody uh, but the family knows where right. where he is. So, uh, <laughs> Navalny, you would have been better off, you would have been better off, your family would have been better off, and probably Russia would have been better off if you had, if you had stayed in Germany. I agree. I absolutely agree with that. Yeah. Jack, yeah. Um, my friend, I, I cannot thank you enough for coming on Criminal Thoughts today. Yeah, it was it was a good. Uh, even though there's a lot of things I I have told many people already, but you know I had a good time. I did too um, because we we really click very well. We do know, intellectually, <laughs> sense of humor. You like the Beatles too, so. Uh, do so, you do you have a favorite soccer player by any chance? You know, I am not a sports guy. Oh, okay. I apologize. <laughs> oh, I don't, you know, I, I don't watch sports anymore, but, you know, soccer is in, is, uh, there's another way that I, I could have been 
uh, uncovered not to be an American. If you had put if you put a soccer ball in front of my in front of me, I kick it. I can't. You I, know exactly what to do with it. <laughs> yeah, you. That's not an American. No, that's a, <laughs> yes. no. That, and I, I, I can't even today. I can't swing a bat. <laughs> <laughs> that's not an American either. No. <laughs> Jack, the, the, so the website is jackbarsky.com. Yes, sir. The book is Deep Undercover. Uh-huh. You do speaking engagements, um, podcast? Yeah, that will come. It's not, and, and the, the master class will be uh, published. You know, I'm, I'm on social media. I'm most active on LinkedIn these days, okay. but I also have a, a, an account on Facebook and uh, Instagram, and I will be more active uh, pretty soon. Beautiful. So if people want to know what's going on in my life. Social media will be uh, okay, and uh, the major announcement announcement will all be on on LinkedIn for sure. I have yet to not answer an, a message or an email that I get, uh, but occasionally I don't continue the conversation because there's some kooks that uh, uh, that, that I collect. <laughs> Jack, um, so you've been doing this for a while. I've been doing this for a while, and uh-huh. I get those kooks too. I've literally uh-huh. had the people that you know the satellites are reading their thoughts. Yeah, yeah, and and uh, and they may want to uh, use. Uh, they may want to uh, ask you for your connections that you have from the past to help them out with some yes. suspicion that they have. I, I, exactly. I, I, I just got one of those. Well, Jack, I know you've got to make it to the gym. My friend, thank you so much for coming on again. I truly, truly appreciate it. Yeah, and, you, and you, you've you been a revelation. I didn't know what to expect. So <laughs> the, the, admiration, <laughs> the admiration is mutual. So thank you, my friend. Thank you so much. Have a great day, my friend. You too. Bye. Okay, bye-bye. That was the amazing, the absolutely outstanding Jack Barsky, former KGB operative. Nowadays, he's speaking. He's... Uh, just recorded a master class about uh, the psychology of spying. Please reach out to the guy, jackbarsky.com. Read the book, Deep Undercover. You can find it on Amazon. The man is absolutely amazing. He's been on several different huge podcasts, Lex Friedman, Jordan Peterson, uh, Concrete as well. I like to think that my interview with him is the best one yet. Just saying, I'm that guy. <laughs> So, my name is Brett Johnson. This is the Criminal Thoughts Podcast, and today has been a damn good day. So, we're going to close it out. How do we close it out? Same way every time. Stay safe out there. Stay secure. Stay vigilant. More importantly, at the end of the day, just do the right damn thing. I'm Brett Johnson. Thank you so much for listening. If you don't mind... Take a moment before we go off the air, hit that subscribe button. Go on over to The Brett Johnson Show. Tune in there, hit that subscribe button. I would really appreciate it. We need the followers. That being said, thank you so much for listening. Until next time.